Joseph Barrow was born on May 13th, 1914 in Chambers County, Alabama. His parents were children of former slaves. You can imagine that, living one generation away from slavery. Sadly, his biological father named Monroe was committed to a mental institution in 1916 and so he didn't know his biological father for much of his life. His mother remarried in 1920 and because of an incident that Joseph had with the KKK, his family decided to relocate to Michigan near the Detroit area around 1926. There he found work for a short time with the Ford Motor Company, but it wouldn't be long before he began his career as a professional boxer. When he was only 17 years old, he had his first amateur fight, and when he was filling out the paperwork for that fight, he left off his last name, only including his first name and his middle name. The paper read Joe Lewis. How many people have heard that name before? And that would be the name that he would be known by for his career. He had what many people consider to be the best heavyweight boxing career in the history of the sport. His record was 66 and three. And he held the heavyweight title for 12 straight years. Between 1939 and 1941, he defended his title successfully 13 times, which is an astounding number if you know the sport of boxing. Through the war years, Joe Lewis enlisted in the army, and while he never saw combat, he did contribute in important ways to the war effort. And through his career and his fights, his, his fights brought in a staggering amount of money for the time. It would be a staggering amount of money for today, let alone in the 1940s and 50s. But unfortunately, Joe Lewis entrusted his finances to the personal accountant of one of his managers, and that got him into deep trouble with the IRS. And the IRS did an investigation, and by the time they finished the investigation, they they uh, concluded that Lewis owed the government $500,000 in back taxes plus interest. That's an enormous amount of money, even today. Can you imagine owing $500,000 in taxes? How much more money would that be in, 19, in the 1950s when a dollar was actually worth quite a bit of money? Well, his debt forced him to go back in the ring But by the 1950s, he had aged substantially. And when he fought against a man named Rocky Marciano, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, he got his clock cleaned. And after that, he bounced around doing exhibition events. He worked odd jobs. He tried to start a number of businesses. But throughout his whole later life, he could never get out from underneath the burden of the IRS. He struggled in his personal life as well. He was married four times. He was friends with a gangster. And he struggled with addiction, just to name a few of his personal struggles. Thanks to the charity of some of his friends, he was able to keep a roof over his head. But for the most part, he died in financial destitution. Not the end you would expect from someone who had such a promising beginning, maybe the best boxer ever. It's a bit of a sad story, to be sure, but it's far from a unique story in the history of the world. Many people throughout history have gone from great beginnings to very sad endings. That's certainly the case here for the first king of Israel, a man named Saul. He started out great. I mean, he had all the attributes of a great king. He was good looking. He was tall, a foot taller than anyone else. He was strong and he was humble. 
God graciously gave him near the beginning of his reign. He graciously gave him a great victory in battle. And the whole nation rallied behind him as king. And sadly, his good beginning doesn't last. He goes against what God had told him to do. And he persists in that rebellion for the better part of his 40-year reign over the people of Israel. And this morning, as we look at our text, 1 Samuel 31, turn there in your Bibles again, we come to the end of his life, and we come to the end of this book called 1 Samuel. And this is where Saul's rebellion comes to an end. And these verses have some important warnings for us about going our own way or doing our own thing. And we would all do well to take these warnings to heart. First, we can see this in the first three verses of our text, is that rebelling against God makes it impossible to keep what you desire. People have all kinds of reasons for ignoring or rejecting the Lord, but trying to hold on to those things for which you have exchanged the glory of your Maker is completely hopeless. You can't hang on to it. Rebelling against God makes it impossible to keep what you desire. Ever since the time that Saul was told by the prophet Samuel that God was going to take the kingdom of Israel from him, he had strongly resisted that announcement. He had fits of rage. He was gripped to the core of his being with fear and anxiety, and he had acted out in sinful ways on many occasions. And all of those things were related to his desire to cling to the throne. In the end, it all proves useless. Listen again to the first three verses here. It says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the Israelites fled before them. And many fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines pressed hard after Saul and his sons. And they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Melchishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. You know, as I read these verses, I can't help but feel an enormous amount of empathy for this man. I know from all that he's done as the king of Israel, I know that he is deserving of what he gets here on account of his stubbornness and his pride. But I also know, I also know that the things that lead to this in Saul's life are sins that can easily entangle any one of us. And the cost that he pays for it is great. I can't help but empathize with him. You know, the Bible says that the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather desires that they turn from their ways and live. Should we not do the same? Should we not have the same desire? To say that warfare in the ancient world was a brutal affair would be an understatement to say the least. And King Saul here gets a front row seat as his army is defeated. Some people run away. Many in the army fall on the battlefield, which would have been pretty horrifying to watch. And beyond that, beyond losing the soldiers and having some desert, it says here that his three sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua, are killed in battle. You watch your children die. Jonathan is the oldest. His name means Yahweh, which is God's proper name. It means Yahweh has given. That's a great name to have. And I think it's one that reflects Jonathan's faith and his courage. He did some great things in his life and his love for David. And we saw some fantastic things from him. And though he's a man of admirable qualities, he dies here this day. Abinadab probably 
Saul's second born. This is what his name means. His name means my father is noble. See a little bit of a shift between the name of Jonathan and Abinadab. It's probably a reflection of Saul's growing problem with pride. I mean, how fantastic do you have to think you are to name your child? My father's awesome. (laughs) And then there's Malkishua, probably not making the top 10 list of popular names to be sure. His name means my king is wealth which again reflects Saul's focus on himself. All three of his boys are taken from the king, which means that his family line will not hold on to the throne. Saul's reign, his family in the future, will not reign over Israel. He loses the army. He loses his three sons. And as the enemy closes in, he's critically wounded and he's about to die, which obviously means in a few moments he will no longer be king. So everything that he's tried to hang on to after the Lord told him what he would lose, everything he's tried to hold on to in persisting in rebellion against God is taken from him here. Rebellion against God is sort of like trying to hold water in your hands. Have you ever tried to do that? Ever taken your hands and cup them like this and put them in a pool of water? Sometimes we do that to take a drink or pour some water. If you're like me, you throw water on unsuspecting bystanders. (laughs) Yeah, I'm kind of like that, sorry. Um, I'm trying to be better. Sanctification is a process, everyone. But if you've ever tried to do that, you ever tried to hold water in your hands? And you can hold on to it for a while, but have you ever noticed that it eventually leaks out. Have you ever noticed what happens? You should try this sometime. Have you ever noticed what happens if you have your hands cupped with water and you try and grip it more tightly? You try and hold on to the water more tightly. What happens to the water? It runs out faster, right? And that's what it's like to live in rebellion against God. Whatever reason you may have for turning away from the Lord, whatever it is that you're trying to hold on to instead of the Lord, no matter how tightly you try to hang on to it, it will slip away one way or another. You know, the good news is is it's quite the opposite for those who are born again by faith in Christ. Any loss that we might suffer in this life for Jesus' sake is only temporary. It's not truly lost. Eventually, God's people inherit the whole of creation. We get it all. There's no loss in belonging to Christ. If Saul had humbled himself, imagine... If Saul had humbled himself, if he had stepped down from the throne voluntarily, he would not have lost. He would have gained. But trying to cling tightly to the throne in opposition to the Lord, he ends up losing it all. That's incredibly sad. I find that incredibly sad. And it's not the only problem that we see here with going against the Lord. We also see in the king's final moments, this second lesson, that rebellion against God feeds the delusion of self-determination. When people persistently refuse to accept that the Lord rules over all things and that he has the right to do so, they try to convince themselves that they're in control even when it makes absolutely no sense. Rebelling against God feeds the delusion of self-determination. The sense of the end of verse 3 here is that Saul has been wounded from one or more arrows in such a way that he receives a mortal wound, that he's going to die. And being in as many battles as Saul has been in, he has probably seen this type of injury in others before. So it's safe to say that Saul knows that his end is near. It's really clear here that he knows he's about to die. 
There is nowhere he can go, and he's about to be overrun by his enemy, and this is what he says in the first part of verse 4. So here he is, critically wounded, and it says this, Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. Now, it's not exactly clear what he means by the term abuse here. He could be thinking that when the Philistines overrun him, they're going to torture him before he dies. Or it could be that he's fearing that they're going to do something to his body after he's dead. It's the way he says it here. Notice he says, they're going to run me through first, which indicates that he'll be dead. And then they'll abuse me. He probably has the second mind and option. He probably has the second option in mind, that they're going to kill him and they're going to do something to his body. So, having already been fatally wounded and he doesn't want to be killed by the Philistines, which is sort of silly because he's already been killed by the Philistines. It's just a matter of a few minutes. So he can't do anything about the situation and yet despite the futility of it all, he comes up with a plan to control the situation. Says to his armor bearer, you take out your sword and you run me through so they won't get the credit for my death. The armor bearer responds in the second part of verse four. It says this, but his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. Why is his armor bearer afraid to strike him down? Well, the most likely answer seems to be that he has some sense of the fear of God and he's unwilling to raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. And when he refuses Saul's request, we see Saul do this at the end of verse four. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and he died. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together on the same day. That is a final act of self-determination in an utterly hopeless situation. His death is absolutely certain and he refuses in the last moments to acknowledge God's right as the author and sustainer of life. That's what the Bible says. God made you, he gave you life, and God's the one who takes you out. That's his right as creator. Saul refuses to accept that. He wants to take the situation into his own hands, so he refuses to put his life and his death in the hands of God, but instead he tries to take it onto himself. It's a total delusion of self-determination. Have you ever seen one of those rides in amusement parks that it's, it's a car I like the ones that are like old cars. They look like Model Ts and they go around. They go around at like a half kilometer an hour on a predetermined set of tracks. Have you ever seen those ones? Do you know what those cars have? I, I like those rides, by the way. They're really slow. They don't go up and down really fast. I can handle them no problem and I can just casually look at the scenery around me. Those are great rides. Do you know what all of those cars have in them? They all have steering wheels. And you can see, when children climb into the car, it's like the greatest thing ever because they think they're driving the car, right? They crank the wheel and they turn it left and they turn it right. Do you know where the car goes? It follows the track all the way around the circuit. No matter how much you turn that wheel, no matter how much you think you're driving, the car follows the tracks. That's a good picture of what people are like who live in rebellion against the Lord. You can try all you like to pretend that you're in charge. You can try all you like that you have control over life, but eventually you will run up against the reality that God is the one who reigns over all things. This is one of the reasons, I believe, this is one of the reasons why Christians should be decidedly and passionately pro-life. Whether we're talking about a human being that has just been conceived in the womb or we're talking about a person's final days upon the earth, people belong to God. And we should act like it. Now, I know that people will make all kinds of arguments to justify both abortion and suicide, but if we really listen carefully to them, what they all have in common, what all of those arguments have in common, is that human beings should be in charge. We should get to decide, not God. 
We get to decide who lives and dies apart from God's law. That is against the Bible, brothers and sisters. That is not how we should think as believers. It is people promoting the delusion that we can be in charge. And the reality is, is that we can't. The reality is we will all come before the judgment seat of the Almighty and we will give an accounting for our lives. That's the reality. Saul here is concerned more about the Philistines and what they're going to do. How much better would it have been for him to be concerned about the Lord instead? To rest in God's rule instead of fighting against it. How much better would that have been? Here's a third lesson for us this morning. This one is truly sobering. Rebelling against God leads to the consequences God promised. Just as surely as the physical laws of the universe produce results, so too the moral laws of that the Lord has established in the world produce results. Therefore, if we choose to ignore God's grace and persist in fighting against what He desires, He will act against us like He has said. Rebelling against God leads to the consequences God promised. Verse 7 tells us about some people who were watching the battle. Listen to what happens there. Verse 7. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. Saul's stubborn resistance to what the Lord had determined to do had terrible consequences for him personally, but it also had consequences for the nation as well. From what we know about the spiritual condition of the Israelites during this period, we know that the sin of the people likely contributed to this as well, but the focus here in this chapter is on Saul. Now, as king of Israel, he would have had to do something very important. All the kings of Israel were supposed to take a copy of God's law and they were supposed to write it out for themselves. So he would have known, he would have been familiar with, he would have seen Deuteronomy 28. In that chapter of God's Word, the people are told that if they will listen to God, if they will obey the Lord, then He will bless them and He will give them the land and that they will live in peace. But... If they rebel against him, they'll find defeat at the hands of their enemies. And if they persist, they will lose the land. Now, because God is gracious, they don't lose the whole land here. But they do lose some of it, don't they? It's exactly what God said would happen. So they flee the city and who comes to live in them? The Philistines come to live in those cities. They lose part of the land. Then verses 8 to 10, zoom back in on Saul. Listen to what it says there. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his armor and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths and they fashioned his body and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. So what you have here is that the Philistines clearly want more than just victory. They want utter humiliation for the king who has defeated them many times over the previous decade. Now notice here that they not only humiliate Saul by pinning his body and the bodies of his sons to a wall, but they also take Saul's armor and they put it in one of the temples of their false gods. In the ancient world, when you went to warfare, it was more than just people fighting against people. It was gods fighting against gods. And it was a way of them saying, our God is better than yours. Now they should have known better. God taught them a lesson 40 years prior. You read about this early on in the book of 1 Samuel when they captured the ark and God puts them through all kinds of problems because they're defiling what is holy. God clearly demonstrated that he is God and their idols are not, but they forget all about that. 
And the Philistines, who are constantly persisting in rebellion, think that they've won the day and they humiliate Saul. But the reality is, is they don't win because of their idols. That's not why the Philistines win here. The Philistines win here because God is doing what he said he would do if his people lived in rebellion against him. That's why the Philistines win. That's why all that happens in these verses happen. You know, as a parent, every now and again, I'll find myself in a store and I have nothing but empathy for another parent who's dealing in the store with the dreaded tantrum. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? I've seen that happen a few times, and the ones that really stand out to me are the ones where the parent threatens a consequence. Uh, then, now I'm re- if the parent threatens a consequence, I'm really paying attention to what happens next. You know, if you don't stop this, this is what's going to happen. And the ones that really, really stand out to me are the ones where the child ends up with a chocolate bar instead of the consequence. Whenever I see something like that, I think to myself, you may have solved your immediate issue. The tantrum has come to an end, but you're setting yourself up for some real trouble in the future. God's not like that. God's not like that. It's true that God is gracious beyond what we can understand. It's true that because of what He's done for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that through faith in Him, we can be forgiven for every single act of rebellion we've ever committed against Him, and that we can be transformed by the renewing work of the Holy Spirit into new creatures. That's that's true. God's grace is beyond measure. That's wonderfully and glorious true but it's also true that if we persist in rebellion God will deal with us according to our evil deeds and if we ignore his salvation we will come under his judgment you may say to yourself what are you talking about my life is totally awesome I can live however I want and it's great I would say to you don't mistake God's patience for complacence he will do what he says you can count on that that's what happens here to Saul and the consequences are much broader than just him the people of Israel as a nation suffer loss and the word that comes to mind to describe this scene is the word tragedy News of these events travel throughout the Philistine territory and they also travel throughout Israel. In the last few verses of this chapter, we're told about how some people respond to this news. And the people that are mentioned here in the last couple verses of this chapter bring us all the way back to the beginning of Saul, to how he started And it reminds us of this fourth important lesson from our text. Here's the lesson. Starting well does not always keep a person from rebellion. The scriptures place far more emphasis on the finish line for believers than it does on the starting line. A good beginning is no guarantee of a good ending. Every single Christian, listen to this carefully, every single Christian is called to relentless perseverance in the faith. Starting well does not always keep a person from rebellion. Here's what we're told in verses 11 through 13. When the people of Jabesh Gilead heard of what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men journeyed through the night to Beth Shan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and went to Jabesh, where they burned them. Then they took their bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and they fasted seven days. What motivated these valiant men 
from this town to journey through the night and to take Saul's body and his son's bodies back for an appropriate burial. What motivated that? Well, many years ago, at the beginning of Saul's reign, a group of people called the Ammonites under a king named Nahash came to attack the city of Jabesh-Gilead. And when they're surrounded and they're being besieged, you know what the people in the town wanted to do? They wanted to surrender to the Ammonites. They wanted to say, okay, we give up. Just don't kill us. And the uh, Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, said, okay, I'll accept your surrender, but here's the deal. I'm going to gouge out the right eye of everybody in town. And the reason why he does that, the Bible tells us, is so that he can bring humiliation, so that he can bring shame to the entire nation of Israel. Now, the people in the city of Jabesh Gilead, they say, listen, give us seven days. We'll send out some messengers. If nobody comes to help us, we'll agree to your terms. You can gouge out our eyes. So the messengers go out. Do you know who comes? Saul. Saul comes to the rescue. It says, when Saul hears the news, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, empowers him. He's able to gather an army to himself, and he's able to rescue the people from their humiliation. Not only does, not only does he do that well, but he does it all in humility. He gives all the credit to God. It was an amazing beginning. These men certainly have that in mind when they bravely go to Beth Shan to put an end to Saul's humiliation and to give him a burial and to bury his sons. Now notice where they bury him. This is fascinating. Look at where they bury him in verse 13. Do you see it there? It says they bury him under a tamarisk tree. That is incredibly ironic. Because the last time we hear about Saul sitting under a tamarisk tree in the book of 1 Samuel is in chapter 22. And in that scene, as he's sitting under the tamarisk tree with all his officials, he becomes extremely angry over the situation of David. David was anointed to be the next king of Israel and Saul had been fighting against that tooth and nail and he flies off the handle at his officials about how this can possibly be going on and it leads to him killing a whole bunch of priests in a city called Nob. Not good to say the least. And it doesn't get any better from there. So he started out well. These verses remind us of his beginning. And it also reminds us of his rebellion. He started out well, but he turns to rebellion against God. Jesus tells a parable about this sort of situation. It's a parable about dirt, about seed and dirt. There's, the seed is the word of God and there's four kinds of dirt. Right? The seed falls on the first kind of dirt and it's taken away. There's no root. Then there's the second kind of dirt. It springs up for a while and then fades away. The third kind of dirt, it springs up. It lasts even longer, but eventually it fades away. And then the fourth kind of dirt is good soil. The plant grows up and it bears continual fruit. Now the, plant, the, the lesson of that parable is this. The planting of the seed is good. It is necessary. You don't get the plant without the seed, right? The beginning's important. It's very good. When the plant shoots up from the ground, it's exciting. It's something to rejoice over. We see life. We see growth. That's good. But if it dies off, it all comes to Nothing. Good beginnings are certainly important. I love to see, I love to see people make professions of faith in Christ. I love to see people who are excited and hungry for God's Word. I love to see people who obey the Lord and follow Him in the waters of baptism. All of that stuff is important. All of that stuff should cause us to rejoice. But they're all just beginning points. Sadly, many times I've seen in my 30 years as a Christian, many times I've seen people fall away after a few weeks, after a few months, even after a number of years. That's always sad. It's always hard to take. But it's never devastating because the fact of the matter is the Bible's focus is primarily on the finish line and not the starting line. 
Funerals are the best (laughs) in one sense. Funerals are terrible, but in one sense, they're the best because you can see how a person finished, right? Starting well does not always keep a person from rebellion. Instead, it is persevering by and in the grace of God every day that keeps us from turning away from him. The application for us is pretty straightforward. It's this, don't be complacent, but instead work out your salvation, brothers and sisters, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, as it says in Philippians 2.12. The end of Saul's life is a sad one. Carl Kyle says that it is the end of an unhappy king. I think he's right. It's a real tragedy because he started off so well, but he finished so poorly. This is the end of his rebellion. There is no more rebellion for King Saul. It's over at the end of this chapter with his death. And so it will be. And so it will be for everyone who persists in such things. Do that. If you persist in rebellion, you do that. You won't be able to hold on to whatever it is that you're trading the glory of God for. You can't hold on to it. Do that and you will feed yourself with the delusion that you are in charge of your own life, that you're the captain of your own ship. Do that and you will experience the consequences of your rebellion because God always does what He says. Do that and it won't matter how you started. You won't finish well. Instead, the call of the gospel is for us to persevere in repentance and faith all the way to the end. Do that! Do that and you will be saved. Do that and you will hear at the end of your journey, well done and enter into an eternal reward. May God in his mercy keep us towards that end so that faithfulness rather than rebellion will be the mark of our lives to the eternal glory of the living God. Let's pray together. Again, Lord, as I think about these verses, my heart is filled with empathy for this man. Lord, the sins that brought him to his tragic end are sins that can befall any one of us so very easily. Oh God, we need your mercy to keep us from rebelling against you. Lord, I pray for your grace in the perseverance of your people. Oh Lord, may we desire to turn towards you rather than away from you so that the name of Jesus might be glorified in us, we pray. Amen. Yes.